share my screen here real quick. Like, uh, like Ryan said, um, unfortunately, Connor had something pop up and he was initially going to present on this topic. So if I struggle on a couple of these, please let me know, jump in. Um, because again, you know, I, I was kind of working through it last night to make sure that I kind of got all the concepts and I think I got most of them, but you know, just to make sure if anybody has any input, please jump in and, and correct me. Um, so let's see, I'm gonna go desktop three. Oh, can everybody see my desktop? My my slides. Yep. Okay, great. So we're in week number four. We're going to talk about basic reactivity tonight. But to see if we can give some people a little bit more time, we'll do um, a quick five minute icebreaker. Um, usually I try and keep the short questions because we have larger group, but now we have a smaller group. And so now I have a short question. Uh, but anyways, um, what is your favorite or most used emoji? Um, and also, ex please expound on it if <laughs> if you need to, because we've only got four people now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we got to fill that five minute interlude. Anybody want to jump in? Uh, I I like the I like the the rolling on the floor laughing one. Like sometimes it's you can just do a smiley face, but I find myself laughing out loud at a lot of stuff, and so. Uh, so when I actually do laugh out loud, then I put in the effort and energy to dig down through the emoji list to try to find the one that, that really captures the laughing. That's why. Excellent. Anybody else? Uh, I can go if you want. So my favorite is the uh, few. And I don't know if that's the right term to use, but it's the one that's supposed to be wiping your brow. I think mm. sometimes in, in, in different emojis, uh, it comes across as a... Uh, uh, not a smiley face with tears, like the crying face, laughing out loud, but it's 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 like the uh, I'm stressed uh, uh, one. Uh, I like to use that because it's it's um, putting you on the spot. And so after after you're done with the debate uh, or or conversation or whatever it is that you're participating in, I always like to oh that was hard. Okay, moving on to the next task. So I always use that one a lot. Great, Sky, you got one. Uh, I think one of my favorite emoji is that one of them that you can have, you have a, like a two fingers and then mm -hmm. it hides, uh, hides your, like a, uh, one of your eyes and then the other one is more open like that because, uh, because they look cute. <laughs> Excellent. I think my favorite, um, I, I, I know this isn't like stock emoji, but I like the party parrot. Like that's like my, that's like my go-to in the Slack channel is the party parrot. I don't necessarily know what it means, but it, I still like it and I use it. So, um, but I've also been using the hundred lately for some reason. I have some student workers that work for me and they use the hundred quite a bit. So I've been using that a lot more to say like, good job or excellent and stuff like that. So I don't know. Whenever I see the party parrot, I know that Colin's probably been here. <laughs> I don't know why I like it. I just, it's just, I don't know. I like it. Well, so I go I've ahead. Got one for the group. Um, so on Slack, what is the, uh, I don't know, uh, psychedelic blob of moving? What is that? What does that represent? That's, that's what he's, that's the party parrot. Oh, is that it? Okay. Okay. I didn't, uh, I'll have to try and zoom in closer to it then. It from from such a small icon, I always thought it looked like the uh, like a blob from you know a movie or something, and then somebody added some psychedelic color changing to it. So uh, <laughs> now that you mentioned it's a parrot, it makes sense. <laughs> if you if you if you search it on Google, you can get some uh, pretty good memes. But um, unfortunately, I uh, unfortunately I, I don't have time. <laughs> so what's them. the What's the, uh, what is the shortcut or what, how do you, uh, key command for that? Uh, uh I think it's just party parrot, uh, party. Yeah. It's just party P A R T Y. And then you'll get it like, oh, well the colon, do the colon and then P A R T Y. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll have to give that a shot. That's cool. Yeah. So, but those aren't stock, so you can't get it on your phone or anything like that, but you can on the Slack channel because you can do custom emojis. Um, so you can, uh, that, that, that may be showing my age too. That's why I don't know what that icon is. I, I haven't uh, taken it that far yet. <laughs> yeah, I, I learn some new stuff every day too as well. So it's like one of those things where it's like, I've seen it. I'm like, oh, I want that. So um, excellent. Cool. Well, thanks for jumping in. I don't, I don't know. Uh, I think Eileen jumped in, but um, I think it's Eileen. Is it Eileen? 
Um, yeah, it's me. I haven't figured out the um, emojis at all. <laughs> but they're still a mystery for me. So I just, uh, you know, if I see something I like, I just use it. I don't have any real preference for, you know, what to use. I have like three that I'll go to, you know, but if you talk to my fiance, she's pretty good at, you know, putting them together. So, but do you, do, does anybody here watch uh, 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 Modern Family? Modern Family. Uh, so there's the, the, I don't know, the parents' dad, not the, not the old person, but the, the, the whole family. It's, it's, it's the whole movie or the whole show is about this family. Anyway, uh, uh, the dad, um, my family tells me that's who I, they remind me of or that I remind them of that person. Anyway, uh, there's a, uh, there's a scene where he's, he's talking about, you know, I'm hip. I know all the, the logo, uh, the shorthand and all this emoji stuff and whatever. And he says, you know, why the face? And so my kids always give me flack about that. Um, I mean, I would, I would definitely, uh, venture in the same arena that you are of, of not really understanding exactly the emoji side of things. Uh, it is a, a very brief shorthand, but uh, they could have some dramatic effects if you don't use them the right way, or they may inflect the wrong emotional state of what you're you're <laughs> providing to somebody over over some textual communication. Anyway, well, that's what I'm always afraid of. I'm afraid I'll use the wrong one. <laughs> I thought the parrot was a dancer, <laughs> but you know, I thought, yay! But, you start to learn them. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Eileen. I mean, to cut you off. No, 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 no. All I was gonna say is, you know, I guess it means the same thing whether it's a parrot or a dancer. It conveys the same message, I guess. Once you start doing like the colon and then start looking through like what the names are, then you start to be like, oh, now I, I kind of get more context of what they are. But um, excellent, great. It's, did you it's guys great. know? Did you guys oh, know? Thank you for the tip. Now I can use them more, more confidently. <laughs> did you guys know that there's a Hadley? uh emoji on the slack if you do colin hadley there's a picture of him with uh with some sunglasses on and i just think we should all aspire to get an emoji on the r for ds slack so make a great contribution and you'll get your own emoji too <laughs> excellent um all right, cool. So let's kind of dive in tonight here. Great conversation. Uh, I appreciate everybody, everybody's input. It's great to learn more about everybody else. And so um, thanks for jumping in. Uh, so here's some reminders. Uh, just for the sake of time, I'm not going to cover these. Um, most of us have been in a session, so it, it, I don't need to spend time to do it. But again, the most important one that I think is that needs to be discussed is, hey, if we need to stop, just let me know. You're not going to hurt my feelings. You're not going to hurt anybody else's feelings. If we have to move, you know, more content to another session, that's cool too. Um, this is all about us learning. So don't be afraid to jump in. Uh, tonight's discussion, we'll talk about basic reactivity. Uh, I really kind of think that this is an important chapter because um, I think this sets up the foundation of how a Shiny app works and how you pretty much develop a Shiny app. And so what we're going to do is we're going to discuss in more detail what inputs and output arguments are. We'll discuss imperative versus declarative programming. We'll talk a little bit about basic reactivity, and then we'll kind of dive a little bit deeper into reactive expressions because we've already been introduced to them in chapter one. Now we're gonna dive a little bit deeper on how to actually use them within our server functions, okay? And then next week, if we have time, depending on how far we get tonight, Ryan, you'll cover chapter four, excuse me, with ER injuries, so. Yes, indeed. Just a heads up with that. And again, I, po I posted that there are still opportunities if people want to present, take a look at those. Um, the schedule is open for anybody to take those sessions. So let's dive into basic reactivity. To kind of give us a, a basic recap of the chapter is, is that we need to kind of think of that there's a difference between uh, the type of programming that we do for um, interactive or analysis code that we're most most of us are familiar with or that we've been learning and the programming required for a shiny app and so when i was reading this chapter there was kind of like a switch in my brain that happened i was like oh my gosh yes i'm using the r programming language however i'm doing a different type of programming to get it to work 
And so my example of kind of where that switch in my brain happened when I was discussing or when I was thinking about this was a couple of years ago when I was learning R, I was like, well, okay, I was learning R and then I was like, okay, I can add shiny to this, you know, to see if I can employ or use shiny. And I figured out that the things that I was learning when I was just doing like just scripts wasn't working in a shiny app. And that was like my biggest struggle. And that's why I like put shiny away for about a year was because I was like, Oh, what I'm learning doing the normal, just doing normal R coding doesn't necessarily translate over into getting shiny to work. And that's, was kind of the biggest pain point for me. And so it's just really what was kind of, I'm just, I'm going to say liberating was this idea of like, Oh my gosh, this is a different type of programming that I need to learn to actually get it to work. And we'll talk a little bit more about that tonight. So some of the things that were discussed in the book were just kind of a quick recap of what we learned so far. Last time we talked about the front end, the UI object, the UI object being um, the part of the application that creates the HTML. HTML is that language that our browser uses to um, represent information on our browser that we can actually see. And then it's simple because we want every user to get the same HTML. And so I kind of made this basic graphic. I don't know if this clarifies it or, or makes it a little bit more confusing, but with the Shiny application, every user is going to get the same HTML experience. Now I say that loosely because I'm sure there's a way in web development to modify what each user gets to see but just for kind of just a basic foundational knowledge with Shiny is, is that everybody gets the same HTML, okay? Now, when it comes to the back end, which is the server object, this has to be a little bit more complicated because each user needs to get their own independent version of the app. And they also need to have a different environment so that when they interact with the app, they're getting... Um, they're getting the UI returned based on their inputs that they provide. And so you wanna make sure the book talks about that if user one is using your application and is you know, adding outputs to it, we wanna make sure that their experience isn't the same as user two's experience during the same time. So um, that's kind of the best way I kind of thought about it was is that you know, everybody's going to get the kind of the same general structure. However, based on the inputs or the session that's occurring based on the user that's using it, they're going to get like a separate experience is kind of how I'm, is how I kind of understood it. Does anybody have any questions about the difference between the front end and the back end? You have to have R installed on the server though, right? Yes. And there is a specific, um, so there is a specific, uh, there's like, there's a shiny server that you can have, or you can be, you know, buy into a third party service like shiny.io or our studio server that gives you kind of that like stuff preloaded. But yeah, from my base knowledge, yes, you do. It yeah. is basically my answer to that. So it's like, it's like if somebody, if you were going to pass like your application code onto somebody else and want them to use it, they would have to have our studio downloaded on their computer. However, if you have a separate server um, outside of your computer, that needs to have, you know, our studio server or shiny server on it, or you need to host it on a third party service like shiny.io um, for to actually, for your users to actually use it. Makes sense. Good question though. Any other questions? So let's kind of dive a little bit deeper into the actual server function. And really when we look at this and, and really the focus of this chapter was the server function. Yes, we talked a little bit about the UI, but the chapter is really focused on discussing the internals of the server function. And specifically it was talking about the inputs and outputs. And we've already been kind of introduced to this already, but the chapter kind of dives into a little bit more about what they are and how we can use them, um, use them effectively to uh, modify the behavior of our application. So when we talk about the inputs, the, this is like a list-like object, and we've kind of already talked about that. 
Um, when you think about inputs, it's just like a list like object that has many different objects within it. And again, that input is going to be based on what's in our UI. It's also used for receiving input. So it's, uh, it's information that's carried over from our browser. So if we have some type of selection, like a text selection, or we have a action button of some type, that's information that our user provides to us that gets sent through that input object into the server, which then the server has code within it to modify the behavior of the app, actual application. The other thing is, is that this is read only. So you can't do things like assign specific variables outside of a, a reactive context. So you can't do anything like X, um, assign like a 12 to it inside the server, you will get an error. And again, you must use such things like render text or reactive because these objects that we're creating within the server need to be rendered inside of a reactive context. The reason again, otherwise we'll get an error. Um, I can't, my mental model right now of it can't expand on that, um, but uh, you know, why we need to have a reactive context, but that's because it's kind of my like best explanation of inputs. Now on the other side of it, we have outputs. Again, these are list like objects. These are used for sending information back up to the UI or for sending information outside of our application. And we'll talk more specifically about that when we get to observers. But um, really, when we talk about outputs, that's either sending information back up to the UI or it's sending, out, sending it outside of the application. And anytime that we provide output, again, back to the UI or outside of our application, we're always going to use some type of render function. And I do want to correct myself here because I want to say that you use a render function anytime that you want to push something to the UI because you can push stuff outside of your application using observer and observer function, which we'll talk about here a little bit later. So here's our basic example. You can see with our UI object, we have a text input where we have people providing us our name. We have our text output, which is a greeting. And then we have our input output and session. So here's our input, which is, that's our output. Our input is actual name. So all we're doing together is we're just putting together, hello, whatever the user provides us for their name, okay? Does anybody have, or what questions can I answer or what discussion or what, what other things do we need to discuss in regards to inputs and outputs as it, as it relates to the server function? Okay, great. So we're gonna move on to reactive programming now. And I, I, I took this, this quote from the book and I thought this one was really important. And again, this was kind of the moment that I had um, where, where I kind of had that shift in mindset of how you actually program within Shiny. And the book says in this quote, reactive programming is an elegant, powerful programming par paradigm, but it, but it can be disorienting for the first time because it's a very different paradigm to writing a script. And so, I guess I kind of want to open up the discussion here a little bit and ask this question. When somebody says that they're writing a script, what are some thoughts that come to mind? I always, I always think of object-oriented programming. So you're writing your functions, passing the, the variables back and forth between those functions. Uh, you always have your main that, that is kind of the I don't know, UI or, or whatever the program is doing uh, inside. Uh, when, when I hear the word script, the first thing that comes to mind is a Python script, a bash script, R studio script, something or R script. So it's going to take inputs and, and manipulate it and give you some kind of an output. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And so, um, you know, when you think of that, you kind of just think of it like just a file, right? You think of it at like a file, um, and when I think of it, it's like when, when I think of it as an interactive script, I think of it as something that it starts from the top, runs all the way down to the bottom, and it gives you some type of output, right? And that's generally when you think of analysis code, that's what happens, right? You write your code up top, you import some data, you do some transformations to it, you visualize it, and you provide some type of output to it. It's very linearly, right? It's step one, all the way down to step 20, okay? What else? What are some other things that come to mind when you think of that? Think of like a script. I'm going to say the same, just kind of like top to bottom. Uh, like 
if you haven't declared, say, a value for a variable in line five, then it's not going to be there in line 10. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And um, so, you know, and that's kind of like what we were discussing before is it just kind of runs all the way through. Um, you're declaring everything. You have to declare something before you can use it. But that's different now. It's different in Shiny now because it's not depending on how things are organized within the script to actually work. It's dependent on the reactive graph that gets created that describes the behavior of the application. And we'll get to that here in a second when we talk about the reactive graph. But that was a big change in my mindset was it's not running top to bottom and you get a single output. And on top of it, some of the standard things that you use, and I think Ryan kind of mentioned this a little bit, like with functions and declaring variables, don't always work because now you need to use reactive functions or reactive expressions because we're not telling Shiny what to do. We're informing it what to do. We're giving it recipes, not commands. And the reason why we give recipes and kind of setting the boundaries of what needs to happen is because our users, the people who are using our applications, are providing the inputs to it. Um, and I'm saying that very, very confidently. So if somebody wants to like add to that or um, provide some more information to it, I'm going to open it up to the floor. It, it made sense what you said a second ago that you're providing the, the application instructions on what to do with a certain input. Is, um, so that, that, that helps. So it's almost like you can put code in there. Um, I'm thinking out loud. So if this isn't right, just correct me, but it's like you put code into the, the script that you, that, are, that you're writing, if we're calling it a script, um, but it may never get used because there may not be an input that lines up with that or the user might put in, might try to do some kind of input, but that's not the input that that, that part of the script needed to use. And so that it's going to error out that way. Anyway, uh, no, yeah, I, just I, thinking out loud while, while you're talking. No, I think that's, I think that's an excellent point. And I didn't, I didn't think about that was, is that um, in your script, like if you're creating an analysis an, an analysis script, like final version of your analysis script, Everything in there is required. It's what you want. However, in a Shiny application, that's not always the case. There might be stuff in your Shiny application that never gets used by your user of the application. So your application still has to work. It still has to provide, you know, whatever you're trying to provide, whatever use it's, it's created for. And so, but when you're creating like an analysis script, you know, you only include what is needed. Yeah. However, and I use the word needed very loosely, but not every time that your user accesses your application or accesses your shiny code, there's some stuff that they may not necessarily need, but you still give them that functionality through what you have coded. And so I think that's kind of getting at the key differences between these two different um, programming paradigms, which is imperative programming, where you issue a specific command and it's carried out immediately but or declarative programming where you're kind of expressing those high level goals and constraints and rely on somebody else to decide what you want done with that code. And in our case, it's what we want the user to do, you know, and we kind of just set the boundaries. And so the book kind of talks about imperative coding as being assertive, declarative coding being passive aggressive to even make it a, even more kind of a, a, a solidified example would be, this kind of make me a sandwich, which would be imperative programming versus declarative programming, which would be ensure there's a sandwich in the refrigerator whenever I look inside of it. Okay. So in that essence, totally, that, to that last line now finally makes sense based off of what you were just saying, which uh, I, I didn't really click until uh, this discussion we just had. Good. At least it's not like a bunch of gobbledygook coming out of my mouth then. So I'm no. glad it's clarifying because at first it takes a little bit. It takes a little bit because, you know, if you're coming from like learning R as a, as a script, you know, that you're just writing it for analysis code, it doesn't make a lot of sense when you transfer it over into the shiny 
part of it because you got to take you got to take the understanding that it's you are using the R language, but you're doing a different type of programming. Yeah. And once you kind of see it, I like doors opened up when I read this. I was like, oh, my gosh, this makes so much sense. I shouldn't have put down shiny for a year because I wasn't getting it uh, yeah. due to my application of R code. It was because it's a totally different. Uh, I shouldn't say totally different, but it's a different programming paradigm. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It kind of made me excited. I was like, wow, this is, this is exciting to kind of learn this because it was something that, I don't know, I guess, I guess I've already pushed my excitement to it, but, um, and, and in essence, you describe your overall goals and the power of shiny is, is that the software figures out how to achieve them without further intervention. So that's basically what's nice about shiny is, is that you kind of just set up the goals of what you want the application to do or give the functionality that your user wants to do and shiny figures that all out. Okay. So what other questions do people have in regards to this difference between imperative and declarative programming? Excellent. So this kind of brings up that kind of discussion that you're having earlier, Ryan, when you're bringing up, um, you know, Shiny doesn't always have to run certain things. And so it comes up with a concept of laziness. And what's nice about this is that with Shiny, Shiny is, be, is lazy essentially because it aims to only do the work that is needed. And it will only update our outputs based on a user's inputs. And so to kind of, to kind of clarify this a little bit more, this concept of laziness, can somebody tell me, looking at this code here, will this application work? What do you think? And while you're kind of looking through that, I'm going to pull up my example here. What do you think? Is this application going to work? It's very small. I see one problem. Okay. What's the problem? You have NIC underscore day um, okay. and server, and you have nice day under the UI. Okay. So going back to my question, knowing that there is a problem in the code, will this application still work? It, this it might. It might run, but I, I don't know if this is right, but it might run, but it's not going to give you the output that you want. Excellent. Yeah, that, that's a trick question. This application will work like it will run. Right. So if I if I run this application, you know, it will run. But if I enter my name into this. Oh, wait, this one is the working one. Whoops. Oh, no, this is the non working one. So if I type my name into this, it will still work. But it's not going to, and, and I use the word work loosely here, because what's missing from my code or what's missing from my application? I'm sorry. I have this thing called nice day, right? I should have another text output right here that says, have a nice day, Colin. So my application works, but it's not, it's being lazy because I haven't, I haven't specified this correctly as in my text output, which is nice day. So it's not going to run this code. So the application is going to run, but it's not going to necessarily work like I want it to because Shiny is lazy. I'll have a quick question. So yeah. let's just hypothetically say that, that you are set up this way. And I know the extra window that you're bringing in, I think is a, is an R, um, uh, app right or is an actual browser yep now that do you would you mind opening that in browser and then uh, uh going into developer tools would you be able to see any of the error in code uh with that let me see so like do you like inspect element inspect yep yep so, and I, I this may go too far for some users so i i don't want to get too far down the rabbit hole but um if you look at your console and it may give you an error that says, hey, you know, there's some portion of your text here that isn't right. It's going to be some, I don't know, weird, funky error, but um, 
I would think that somewhere along the lines, it's going to no. give you a breadcrumb to, to start digging into further. No, I mean, because here, here it is, it's running in here. It's running in the application right here. Right. Yep, so yep. there's no error that gets printed to the console. And uh, on, not, sorry, not that console. I was referring to the, to the developer tools console uh, across the top of your, your head or there. Um, next to elements there's console oh yeah yeah oh okay so that's what, what i'm saying is yeah no it's it's such a just dumb arbitrary error that you really don't know why it's happening but at least it gives you some reason to question the the code that you're producing something is is not adding up properly um hmm. you're 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 sending it some response or it's trying to to process some response but it's not giving you anything back so it, instead it's just passing you an error Oh, so it's, that, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, that, that may be a topic later in the book. I haven't actually read the entire text yet. So um, I don't know if there's a way to add additional handling of errors in, in shiny apps uh, so that you have a graceful output of what should be stated. Yeah, I see what you're saying, but I don't, I don't know. Is this error that this 404 error related to not having, you know, possibly not. not yeah. Because Possibly that's what not. I'm, because right now I see it like doing the favicon, which would be your mm -hmm. uh, up here in your tab, right? Yep. So I don't know if this error is related to this, but I think it, I, I think, and I may have to get this a little bit more is just like this application isn't even running this code. It's not even running this because it's not in the UI. And, and two, if you look at it, like you look at like the outputted HTML, HTML, HTML elements, I only see this one. Hello. I don't actually see the, have a great right. day. So your rendered output, right? Good point. I, I think the other way that we can look at this, the other way that I'm thinking that we can look at this is like if I open up a terminal and do, and again, um, I don't want to, for people that, you know, that are kind of new to Shiny, what we can do is we can CD into it. Uh, let me do uh, CD into... And all I'm doing here is I'm just jumping into samples. I might have to show it to you. Maybe we can look at it afterwards, Ryan. But what I'm thinking okay. is, is what we could do is we could run it in showcase mode. Yeah. And what we could do is see, like we could actually play with the showcase mode to see if it is actually running this code to test my, I'm being very confident that it's not running, but I just want to yes. double check my assumption. But because it's lazy, I don't think it's running it. I don't think it's running now it at all. So, you, so another, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was going to say you could also just correct it and then see if that same error. Okay. Comes yeah. Up. Or what I could the, do. I, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to add another comment to just laziness in general. So does that imply the same concept of, of lazy loading or is that a different subject? Um, I may be getting caught in the word lazy. Uh, so it, has anybody dealt with the reveal JS side of, of presentation media outside of R? So if you if you make a presentation, you actually compile a presentation mode in, in R and then generate that as a web output. What R is doing is is reveal JS, which is a web friendly presentation. It's similar to PowerPoint. Um, in that same case, you've got this web server and it's it's producing uh, output for you. Um, there's a feature within reveal that says lazy loading. It, it, it's, it's trying to optimize the uh, exchange between your, your computer and the server itself. Now you're, I know you're running this on your local machine, but if we were, if we were in a, in a more uh, structured environment of, of coding uh, your calls could be to a web server, you know, across the other side of the U S and so that, that cached or, or lazy loading uh, tries to optimize the bandwidth of, of what you're displaying. So, you're not uh, asking the the computer to, you know, it's not buffering, but it's kind of the same concept of buffering. Uh, you're you're pulling down code only as needed, or preparing, I guess. I'm not familiar. I mean, I'll let anybody jump in. Um, I'm not familiar with like kind of the the developer part of that, um, but I, I kind of see what you're saying. Like, it's like I, I think if I'm understanding what you're saying right, it's like conserving resources because it doesn't need to run is what I think well, you're like, saying. Yeah, ahead, as, yeah. You're, as, you're go, as you're going through the slide deck, right? Let's just say it's a hundred slides long. 
well, I'm not going to completely download, you know, cache locally the entire presentation. That's that's kind of a waste of resources. I'm only going to pull down, you know, the first 20 slides, right? And as you go through it, now you see this progression of requesting, you know, more information from the server as you're as you're going through your your slide deck. I'm uh, that's called lazy loading, and I don't know if if uh, Shiny is doing a similar process. I comprehend the, the method in which you're explaining it with, if the code doesn't work, it's not going to waste its resources to show it to you. Um, it just won't render. Um, yes, I, I think, I think, they're, I think it's similar. I think it's similar, but I mean, I don't know enough about, I don't, I, I don't know enough about, you know, kind of that, like the developer side of that, because uh, I, I just, yeah, I don't know. I think they're similar by from the way that you're kind of explaining it, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. Now I got showcase mode up here real quick. And like, if I type in, you know, right here, uh, Colin. Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess showcase mode's not, oh, I gotta be in the server, don't I? Uh, app nice day, am I running app nice day? Well, anyways, I don't think it is running, but uh, I don't know. I can dig into it a little bit more just so that we can save some time, but. Um, I think, I don't, I don't think I answered your question, Ryan. <laughs> That's okay. I may have taken us off on a track. I apologize. No, it's, it's good. It's just some of those things I'm not real familiar with, but I mean, if somebody is, um, please jump in. Excellent. Um, so kind of going back at what the book was talking about, like if you're working on a shiny app and, and you can't figure out why certain things aren't rendering to your, um, to your like your UI, it a, a good thing to look at is to make sure that all of your outputs are correct. You know that they match up because if they match up, then you might be able to know like okay, uh, that this might not be working correctly. So, um, what questions can I answer for anybody um, regarding kind of looking at laziness? Uh, I have a question. Um... You put like up in the UI, you put greeting and nice day in quotation marks. Uh, and I can't, I don't know if there's a rule or how do you keep track about like what goes into quotation marks and what, and what does it, um, I mean, I get it for this. It makes sense. Like if there's a pattern I see, but I've also seen like sometimes you put, you put the column names or the, whatever you call it after the dollar sign. Um, you put that in quotes and sometimes you don't. Does anybody have any input for that? Okay. Well, I, well, I think, well, right. I think what to think about it is it's kind of, this is the way I think about it is just like input is like a list and remember how we like pull things out of a list. It would be like, I'm thinking of it like output oh, bracket bracket this you know name all oh, right yeah that's the way i would think of it and because we're subsetting it out of this list like object we have to use this as a string value because again if we if we did it like this this would be like it calling an object in our environment and it and that doesn't exist in our environment that's the way i think of it um Maybe that's a way to kind of help you kind of remember, like, yeah. if we're calling it, because we're calling it from this, well, it's output, not input, like output, because yeah. we're outputting it. So. Yeah, I get it. That helps. Okay, cool. What other questions can I answer? Great conversation. Great input. Again, I think we're, I think we're doing a good job of, of kind of parsing this apart. Okay, great. So let's jump into the reactive graph. Um, I think this is probably, once I kind of understood that this was like the back end of the Shiny app and how it kind of picks and chooses how things run, this is when things like really started to click for me, um, is the reactive graph. Really the reactive graph, it kind of, dis, it kind of, it's created on the back end to tell Shiny how things are run or how things are specifically executed. Now, you only have to understand three components of a reactive graph. Your reactive graph can be very complex. 
but really you only need to understand three components to understand any reactive graph. That's inputs, that's reactives, and that's outputs. And the book kind of talks about that these all fit together. Inputs send things out, outputs take, take things in, reactives can do both things. Now we'll talk, about, we'll talk about consumers and producers here in a second, but just if you understand these three elements, regardless of how complex the, uh, the reactive graph gets, you should be doing pretty well of understanding um, how a Shiny app kind of works and how things are related to each other. So it describes how inputs and outputs are connected, is a diagram that identifies the reactive dependencies. And I'll talk about that here in a second. And it describes the relationship as so, that an output has a reactive dependency on an input. And so in our case with our simple app that we have here, we have our input, which is name, and we have our greeting, which is our output. Now, you'll notice that the symbol isn't necessarily correct. The person who put these materials together before was using a package called Diagram R. And I found out that Diagram R doesn't have the symbol, so they just used a square. Um, kind of highlight that for everybody. But when you look at this, we can say that because greeting is our output, we can say greeting has a reactive dependency on an input. And so a reactive graph is kind of that powerful tool to understand how our app works. And so again, regardless of how complex our Shiny apps may get, if you understand these three components of input, reactive, and output, you can understand the reactive dependencies within your Shiny app. And so uh, the book kind of suggests if you're having trouble of understanding of how things are related and how things are working in your app, Draw, draw it by hand. You can use Diagram R, which these notes use, or you can use this tool called React Log. Um, the book's gonna talk more about this in later chapters. I think, Ryan, I think I, Ryan, uh, I passed this on to you later, or Ryan, I think I passed along to you, um, I think earlier this week, the React Log, but this is a package that you can use to see the different reactive dependencies and how they all work in your specific Shiny app. And if you notice it, again, there's only three basic components. You have your inputs, you have your reactives, and you have your outputs. So um, when I first started learning Shiny, just a little experience for myself, is I looked at the reactive graph of an application one time and I, I almost lost my cookies. I was like, oh my gosh, I have no idea what's going on here. But when I read this chapter and I was like, okay, I only need to know three things, input, reactive, output. You understand those three things, you can understand pretty much any Shiny app. Now, I say that confidently. There's probably some crazy, wicked Shiny app out there that uses something different. But really, the book kind of says, you understand these three things, you're doing pretty good. Um, what questions can anybody answer about the reactive graph? Uh, just on that visualizer, do you... Um, does that before or after, is that a planning tool or is that like an assessment tool after? Assessment tool. So like you'll, you'll run your application and then it will actually show you all the different dependencies and how they run. Don't let the motion confuse you right now. We'll talk more about this in depth later on in the book, but it's just kind of a post assessment tool. Like after you put your app together, it helps you visualize your inputs, your reactives and your outputs. Again, like I said, the first time I opened up React Log to an application, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm, <laughs> I'm in the matrix or something. I, I, I don't know what I'm doing. So, but again, starting from the foundation, you understand inputs, reactives, outputs. You can understand pretty much any complicated app. Uh, okay, so any, what other questions do you have about the reactive graph? Well, it looks like the um, input and output would be in the UI. Like those portions would be the UI and the reactive would be in the server. Would that be fair? Yes. Um, if I'm yes, I think so. I think it's I think that's a good way to put it. I'm saying that because you're referencing inputs and outputs. Well, you're you're referencing your inputs in your server, aren't you? Because like if we go back to our application example here. We have our outputs, but we're referencing it out here. Does anybody want to help me clarify? Because I'm kind of talking out loud. I don't know for sure, but it's, it seems logical. 
gut reaction right now, Eileen, is yes, but. Okay, yeah. Until it's overridden by more knowledge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I think so. But again, that's probably not the best answer, but I, I'm still learning. So I probably can't yeah, give you. We all are. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. A better explanation. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I post that question in, in the Slack too, because I think that might, I, I think what's really important about this is with the reactive graph, what's really important is, is this kind of is a visualization to show you how the application is going to run. Now, if we go back to our previous discussion of a script, we're writing a script so that it goes from like top to bottom, left to right. But when it comes to how our shiny apps are, are put together, the shiny app is essentially putting this reactive graph together. And this reactive graph is what dictates how things are run. Not how our script is written, but how that reactive graph is created. I guess that's kind of the most important thing that I think coming off of this, but that's my yeah. thought of it. Sounds good. Sky, did you have a question? I think you're muted, Sky. Yeah, I just muted. Okay, so I want to know, like, for example, for uh, any output that you put in the, for any results that you put in the output, can you use it back into the input? Yeah, I think you would. I, yes, I, I think that answer is yes. I mean, um, there is some discussion of observers, but I wish I, this is like moments that I wish I had more experience because yeah. I'm saying these things confidently, Yeah. but from my reading of the book, I would say, yeah, I mean, you know, why are you creating an output? You're creating an output so that you can use it in your UI of your application. But, but would it be part of another reactive, like an intermediary reactive, if it's going to be the output from, if it's going to input and then also be an output and then be an input and an output. Again, it might be an intermediary reactive, but I don't know. Okay, no, that's so it. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Sky. So, the, so it means that they actually can uh, use interactively. So the reverse, you know, the picture, the reactive graph, if the picture, it goes from input to reactive and then an output. So the reverse is also true. It can go from output to reactive to input. Right? My yeah. understanding. Yeah, I think so. And I think Ryan had a good point there. Like, because now, now we're getting into the conversation of producers versus consumers. But um, yeah, but no, you're right, Ryan, is that, yeah, you could have an output that just goes into an expression. But that's just my view of it. But Ryan, I see the other Ryan, I think you had a, had a comment. Well, I was going to support Sky in, in thinking. So it, when I started messing with Shiny early on, I've never I've never actually made this work the way I'm thinking in my mind. But I wanted to develop a web-based form, right? So give me some input. I'm going to have the, the you know, data frame or whatever it is I'm, I'm ingesting into R, process that information, and then present it back out again. Not a calculator, but I mean, you could make it as simple as a calculator. So Sky, if you, if you don't mind uh, expanding, would would like a, a web-based form be a possibility of of kind of that output side becoming an input again? Like you're 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 taking it from the client side, the computer, the user that's that's messing with Shiny, and then the server is ingesting that and, and processing it in some manner. Is that maybe how you were explaining it? Yeah, sort of same. Yes. So it's a it's a backwards flow of, of information. Your your client, your computer, the user is is the one that's inputting data. You're processing it on the server side, the the server, I guess, script side of it. You're ingesting that information from the user and somehow doing some information exchange with it. I may have just confused well, it I even more. I don't have a much experience with uh, okay. shiny app. So I was just reading at the graph and thinking about uh, how the data, the flow of the data, how it works. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the thought that comes to mind, and I, I know I'm sorry, I'm expanding on the time frame, so let me, let me just keep it brief, but with Shiny as a web service or within the RStudio paradigm of, of web development, um, 
there are many, many different types of languages that you can work with that uh, gives you some, I don't know, data exchange and puts outputs and, and it's, it's always client server side language, right? What do I want my web page to look like? Here's a you know text cell that I want uh, a user to drop down or or put something in or you know a slider or whatever it is. Once the user makes an input to that, sorry, a, a a a change in that text field, do something with it, right? Send it back to the server and then process it on the server side. Um, the web development end of HTML and, and JavaScript and all the other nuances that go along with all that. Shiny supports all of those exchanges. We're using our current language to talk about R and, and R Studio and, and how Shiny's doing it. Um, my mind keeps going backwards into the to the client server side thought process of Python with Django or you know a Ruby server, a Node.js server, you know any of these different web services, uh, uh, any of the JavaScript languages, Angular and whatnot. Um, and I know I'm, I apologize for expanding further, but I'm supporting what Sky's asking. I'm pretty sure the 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 comment is is correct. Okay, the way I see it though, um, what Sky was saying was, okay, if you put pounds, you want to convert it to kilograms, and and then you you have an ability to also convert uh, kilograms into pounds. Would it be two input fields? And how would how to how would the reactive portion work? Could could the input um, this dynamically change from pounds to kilograms or can the output change from, you know what I mean? I think that's kind of how I see that example. That's a great, no, that's an outstanding statement. So the, in that case, you know, if you had a drop down that said pounds and a drop down that said, or sorry, the drop down was populated with both pounds and, and, and kilograms by the user selecting either or the math and the server side and what it's, it's going to be sending back to the web page is going to be that conversion. Uh, that would be an exact identical input output exchange, yes. And, okay, great. Yeah, good. Go ahead, Eileen. Sorry, I didn't mean. Yeah, to no, I think that's because from what I see, yeah, I see, um, uh, I guess because I'm just learning, I, I just see two input fields and two output fields, you know, in the UI. Um, but maybe that's my lack of imagination. <laughs> but I guess we could we actually we could we could have one output field. Yeah, I don't know. I, I guess I'm just still thinking about it. No, I mean, I, I mean that's a good point too, Eileen. Is like you could have two inputs that you know on the server side of the application transforms it in some way to send out one output too. Right. Right. You know that's that's a really interesting statement too. Um, and, and again, I think that kind of comes back to the, the reactive graph and looking at it and saying, what's your inputs, what's your outputs, and, you know, what's your reactive? Because your reactive is set up so that it takes, it's, 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 the reactive is like a recipe. It's waiting for an input. Right, right. And so, and whatever that input may be, that you could have 20 fields, like Ryan was saying, in a form. And you take all of those fields you can, I'm thinking of it like Ryan saying with the form, you could have 20 fields that are inputs on the server side. It processes all those together. Say you put it into a SQL query yeah. and then you write it to a database. Now we're kind of getting a little bit further away. That's more of observers because observers are the things that send it outside of the application, but it's the same thing. You're taking all those inputs, processing it in the server, and then you know doing whatever you want with it, whether you push it to the UI, push it outside of the app. Yeah, right, right. So there can be a lot of staging, you know, um, you know, occurring in, in, in the uh, reactive side, I guess. No, that's a good point, because I was messing around with an app that I've been playing around with. And I was thinking about that, because later on in the book, it talks about reducing the amount of computation that you do inside of your server side, and trying to take that computation outside of the server. And so, um, the book talks about this later about like ways you can do that to take that computation outside of your server, because you don't want shiny doing that. You don't want shiny wasting computing resources, trying to process things because on the UI side, it's going to be a bad experience for your user. I don't know if you've ever used like an application where it like takes like 30 seconds, 40 seconds to run, you know, but and you again, didn't want it to run. 
<laughs> and you didn't want it to run or it's not you it's not useful but um again i'm thinking out loud too so is does shiny have an interrupt button you know can you say yeah stop <laughs> i guess the browser has a stop button i guess i'm sure you could i mean that would just be another that would be an event reactive and right now we're that's something that we'll talk about here in a second is event reactives you could probably have a start and stop i mean mm -hmm. why couldn't you you know yeah well, in the That's book, it talks about starting, starting a calculation and then, you know, but if you, if you start a calculation, it's taking too long. You should have a stop, I guess. <laughs> I post know. that, post that question in the Slack, because I, I think we could probably put an example together to, to clarify the event reactives, because I yeah. wonder if you can do that. I wonder if you can create like an interrupt action. Right. Or if you would just press the to stop on the browser, like stop loading. Huh. Post that to the Slack because I, I take that as a challenge because I would I think I, I think we could figure out an example for that. Yeah. Okay. You know, Eileen, the more I'm thinking about it, just in the back of my mind, I don't think the stop button is going to prevent the server from stopping. Okay. It just severs the well, it just severs the call from your your client side to the server. Uh it it or the the loading of it, I guess. Um if, if you've already injected a process into the server, there's nothing that the user could do from an HTML standpoint to prevent the server from stopping. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so I, let me think on that for a bit, uh, thinking of how R uh, manages cache memory and, and, and what it's doing in the background. I'll, uh, I'll see if I can find some examples for that too. Okay, okay, thank you, Ryan. You bet. That takes out, that's, that, that's a pretty good challenge. If you could have a start and an interrupt button, <laughs> I might have to take, I might, have, that might be bothering me this week. So that's a good challenge. I like that one. Well, the, the first thing that comes to mind is breaks, uh, uh, put breaks in your code. Uh, so it doesn't uh, just run off into the, into the night and crash your computer. That's a good, that's a good point. Uh, we're, we're kind of running out of time here and I think we're at a good stopping point. Cause I think we're getting to reactive expressions. Um, but we were kind of getting in that discussion of producers and consumers, you know, understand that there are, this is new vocab, same things, just a different classification of them. And I think this is a good, good thing to kind of look at. I also, cause we're running out of time, but, um, and we'll wrap this up here is the example application that is in the book clarifies this very, very well. So if you have to read through that two or three times, like the specific app example, once I read through that, like a second, I think on my third time looking through that example, I was like, this makes a lot more sense. And so I, I highly suggest kind of really understanding that because it really helps you kind of understand how um, reactive expressions work and how the reactive part works. It's so. eight o'clock. It is eight o'clock. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I guess we'll, I'll, open it up to you, Ryan, if you want to kind of do some um, yeah. final so, thoughts and yeah. go from there. Yeah, I think we should pick up from here starting next week. How much more time uh, would you like on this one, Colin? Uh, so we got execution order, which doesn't maybe like 10, 15 minutes, because really it's just building on those concepts of reactives. It's just adding, hey, do you want to do it by time? Do you want to do on click? Okay. So maybe 10, 15 minutes okay. at max. Sounds good. So we'll pick up here next week, and then I will at least introduce and get us started on the case study, which I thought was really, really entertaining. So give it a read if you haven't yet. Chapter four on Mastering Shiny. Um, other than that, I appreciate everybody's time. I mean, this is the value of these meetings, right? Is you start to think and start to share ideas and ask questions. And so... Uh, I, I appreciate being part of it and thank you guys for, for your contributions as well. Other than that, we will meet up again next week. Sound good? Yeah, sounds good. All right. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank Thanks, you. Bye-bye.